Representatives Custer and Raskin are here to mark the anniversary of one of the darkest days in our country's history and to highlight the truly existential stakes for our democracy in the 2024 election. This isn't just going to be an election about policy differences. Though the differences on issues are of critical importance and are certainly very stark, this election is about something more fundamental. This election is going to be about whether we continue to have a democracy where the will of the people is respected and where violent mobs are not unleashed to try to deny the results of free and fair elections. As I watched the insurrection on January 6th, um, I could not have imagined that three years later, Donald Trump would be on the glide path to the Republican Party's nomination. But here we are. On January 23rd, when the eyes of the nation are on New Hampshire, Granite Staters will have an opportunity to send a very clear message, a message that we stand against extremism, a message that we stand for the bedrock democratic values that have guided us since our country's founding, and a message that we stand with Joe Biden. That's why I'm proudly writing in Joe Biden for president, and I urge my fellow Granite Staters to do the same. Now I want to take a moment to introduce someone who has been outspoken about her own very harrowing experience on January 6th, and I'm sure uh, that she also has some ideas about what she's doing on Election Day, January 23rd, and that's my good friend, Congresswoman Annie Custer. Thank you, Donna. I'm Congresswoman Annie Custer from the 2nd Congressional District. Uh, I come from Hopkinton, New Hampshire, and I'm very proud and excited to be with you today. Uh, over the weekend, we release brand new video footage from the events of January 6, 2021 in the U.S. Capitol. I was one of the last uh, members of Congress that was able to evacuate from the gallery of the House chamber. And we were in a very precarious situation. We had to don gas masks because tear gas had been used to fight off the insurrectionists. We could hear the pounding of the door. We could hear the crowd coming closer and closer to us. We were warned that they had breached the Capitol, that they were coming our way. And we knew that their intention was to disrupt the uh, certification of the vote by doing harm to us as members of Congress. But this new video is truly chilling from the third floor vantage point security camera where you can see the policeman running frantically around because he could hear the mob coming up the stairs. You can see four of us members that cross the hallway and duck into the elevator with the policeman that saved my life that day. And then if you count, it is just 30 seconds to when there are members of that mob in that hallway seeking, searching, hunting members of Congress. They have backpacks. We don't know what would have happened. We don't know what was in the backpacks. But we do know that weapons were found, bear mace, zip ties, and you know that it would not have been a positive impact. So even if they had taken us hostage, if they had injured us and sent us to the hospital, we had a very slim majority that day. It was a majority of only five Democratic members. On the other side of the locked door were two dozen members of Congress that were literally in a hostage situation, locked into the gallery, could not escape. And if more than five Democrats had been unable to return to the chamber that night to certify the election, it would not have happened. It would have been a conversation between uh, Mr. McCarthy and Donald Trump, and you all and America would have woken, woken up to a very different scenario of chaos and confusion. And so I'm very proud to have my colleague, my dear friend, Jamie Raskin, here in New Hampshire, 
to help me spread the word with Donna Susie and with our entire team of grassroots supporters who are going to be standing at the polls all across the state on January 23rd to write in Joe Biden as our next president of the United States. And we need to do that to save our democracy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Annie. And I was reflecting as you spoke that uh, if the insurrectionists were ready and willing to hang Mike Pence, one can only imagine what they would have done to you. Um, the January 6th insurrectionists who are in jail today were convicted of serious offenses like violently assaulting federal officers, seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow or put down the government and destruction of federal property, and conspiring to interfere with a federal proceeding. Um, a majority of them entered guilty pleas. Uh, in any event, all of them got legal um, due process, um, and their sentences have generally um, been below federal sentencing guidelines and below what the prosecutors were asking for. In 67% of the cases, um, their uh, sentences were below the federal sentencing guideline recommendation. I say all of this because Donald Trump and Elise Stefanik over the last few days have taken to calling the January 6th prisoners hostages, uh, which is a, a scandal and an outrage. Um, it is uh, a category error to confuse convicted prisoners who have had um, every element of due process with hostages. Hostages are people who are held for a political uh, or financial ransom illegally by criminals. So um, I suppose it's futile dealing with Donald Trump, and it may be futile dealing with Elise Stefanik, but I would demand that both of them retract um, this outrageous characterization of people who are in prison for their participation in a violent assault on America and for their participation in uh, wounding, injuring, bloodying, and hospitalizing uh, 150 of our police officers. Um, Donald Trump, of course, is also out there saying that he will grant pardons to these January 6th uh, hostages. And uh, America should take note. When Donald Trump talks about pardoning his political friends and allies, he means it. He's already pardoned um, convicted criminals Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, Dinesh D'Souza, um, and uh, a numerous of other people who have come to form the inner core of his 2024 political campaign. And now he is promising to pardon the people who will become the shock troops of political violence in the country if and when they are released from jail. Um, this is, of course, a, a, a shameful ethical collapse in the Republican Party. Um, Abraham Lincoln created the Republican Party as a party of freedom against slavery for union. Um, and Donald Trump has reduced it to a cult of authoritarian personality. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said at the beginning of the Civil War that an insurrection is a war on the very first principle of representative government, which is the right of the people to choose their own leaders. And that, of course, was the heart of the criminal and constitutional violation that we saw take place on January the 6th. Now the question is whether we will adhere to the Constitution of the United States, including Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that no one who has sworn an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, who violates that oath by engaging in insurrection or rebellion, shall ever be allowed to hold federal or state office again. It is written in clear and unambiguous language. The original purposes of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment could not be any clearer when the radical Republicans who added it to the Constitution first introduced it over on the House side. It would have swept far more broadly. They said they would disenfranchise for life anybody who had participated in secession or insurrection or rebellion. And when it got over to the Senate, they said, no, let's just zero in on the most culpable offenders. So it won't be anybody who participated in insurrection 
um, or rebellion. It will be only those people who participate in insurrection or rebellion who had before sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution as an office holder. And even for those people, we won't disenfranchise them for life. They can continue to vote. We just won't allow them ever to hold office again. So you can see how Donald Trump is right in the bullseye center of the constitutional prohibition against insurrectionists and people who organize insurrections against the Constitution from ever holding office again. We've got an anti-insurrection constitution. I've been amused, um, Congresswoman Custer, over the last week or two to hear people refer to the little known or the obscure Section 3 of the 14th Amendment as if its fame somehow uh, controls its authoritativeness. Of course, it's got nothing to do with it. But in any event, anti-insurrection is a dominant theme in our Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says, Congress shall have the power to call forth the insert call forth the militias of the states in order to suppress insurrections. The Republican Guarantee Clause says, Congress shall guarantee to the people of the states a Republican form of government and assist them in putting down domestic violence. The Treason Clause, the only place in the Constitution where a crime is defined, says that treason consists of levying arms against the United States or adhering to the enemies thereof. Our Constitution is centrally concerned with insurrection. Now, I, I hear from some of my Republican friends that it would be undemocratic to keep Donald Trump off of the ballot. Everybody's got the right to be on the ballot, they say. Really, how about the 75 million people who are not age 35 who can't run for president? We've got colleagues we serve with, Republicans and Democrats, who can't run because they're below 35. Maxwell Frost, who serves on my committee, the Oversight Committee, um, is, I think, 26 or 27 now. He can't run for president. Is that undemocratic? Well, it may or may not be undemocratic, but it is constitutional. It's in the Constitution, just like the ban on insurrectionists. How about people who were not born in the United States? Right? Arnold Schwarzenegger was born in Austria. Jennifer Granholm was born in Canada. They can't serve uh, as president. It may be unfair. It may be fair. It may be unconstitutional. It may be, uh, I mean, it may be democratic or undemocratic. It's definitely constitutional, though. It's in the Constitution. So the question is, will we agree to be bound by our own Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land? That is what the Supremacy Clause says. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And if you think about those different forms of disqualification for president, um, the disqualification of insurrectionists is the most limited and by far the most morally defensible. There are a lot of people who were born abroad who are American citizens who might be great presidents. There are a lot of people under 35 who might make great presidents. But to be in the group of about a dozen people disqualified because they participate in insurrection today means that you have chosen to disqualify yourself. And that is a morally defensible uh, category, I would have to say. And by the way, you know someone who understands that constitutional disqualifications for running for president um, are perfectly constitutional and insists upon them? Donald Trump. Because you'll remember that he made the beginning of his political career going around the country saying that Barack Obama was not qualified to be president because he was born in Kenya. Now, he was wrong about the facts of that because Barack Obama was not born in Kenya. But he was right about the principle, which is that if you're not constitutionally qualified, to run for president, you can't run. And that's the situation that Donald Trump finds himself in because he incited an insurrection against the union as the House of Representatives found when it impeached him and as 57 of 100 senators found when they voted to convict him for what they did. As President Biden said the other day, all over the world, democracy's under siege. The autocrats uh, in Moscow, the theocrats in Saudi Arabia, the plutocrats who run the Republican Party, all of them are in league against democracy. All of them are cheering for Donald Trump to come back into office. In the meantime, we have in President Biden um, a great leader who is committed to the common good of the country. I sat there for four years under uh, President Trump. We had Infrastructure Week. We had Infrastructure Month. We had Infrastructure Press Conference. We just never had infrastructure bills. And we got that in the very first week of the Biden administration. We passed a bipartisan infrastructure a bill that 
pat that adopted $1.2 trillion for the roads, the highways, the ports, the airports, cybersecurity, uh, broadband, rapid internet in the rural areas. President Biden did that. We got the Chips and Science Act done. We got the Inflation Reduction Act done. We now have the lowest inflation rate in the Western world as well, as well as the highest employment rate we've had in more than 50 years. So this is a very successful president who's making democracy work at the same time that he defends the entire structure of democracy against attack uh, by Donald Trump. This election is about two completely different forms of government. And one is an idea of democratic government being an instrument of the common good of the people to serve the people every day versus the idea of government being an instrument for private self-enrichment for the guy who gets in and for his family and for his hotels and for his businesses. So we could not have a more stark contrast in the choice in 2024. I'm thrilled that the people of uh, New Hampshire are rallying uh, to President Biden and I thank my friend Annie Custer for inviting me to come up here and uh, Senator Susi, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Great. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Raskin, I'm just wondering, we saw uh, your former January 6th committee mate, Liz Cheney, up here uh, last week giving a speech about democracy at Dartmouth. I know you're going back later today. I'm just wondering how you see New Hampshire factoring into your message of democracy two years out from January 6th. Well, um, the, New Hampshire, of course, is a beautiful state, and I've been able to enjoy a snowy New Hampshire since I got here. Um, it's a, a state that is also beautiful because of the kinds of grassroots participatory politics that have always characterized um, the state in presidential history, as well as your internal state politics. So, um, you know, the New England model of town hall politics and face-to-face -face organizing and communication is essential, and that's the very opposite of mass propaganda and disinformation politics. So I think New Hampshire um, you know, always has something to help to teach the rest of the country about how democratic politics should take place. Representative Raskin, with that being said, the Democratic National Committee sent out a letter calling the, to two New Hampshire Democrats for selecting delegates. Call, they, they were essentially calling it meaningless because it's an unsanctioned primary. Do you have any response to that? And do you think that's fair? to voters here? Is that some form of... Well, I've been to a, a bunch of uh, meetings and conversations and town hall uh, type discussions since I got here, and all of them have been uh, profoundly meaningful to me. Um, and so I don't think any kind of uh, politics is uh, meaningless that we see, other really than um, Donald Trump's speeches. So I, I guess I would take exception to that characterization, at least of what I've seen in New Hampshire since I got here. To follow up on that question for Representative Custer, both Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson said today that the DNC is engaged in, as was already mentioned, um, voter suppression by calling the New Hampshire primary meaningless. So I'm curious your, your response to that from the right and Biden perspective. Um, do you believe that this letter constitutes a form of voter suppression? To be honest, I don't think the voters are focused at all about some committee in Washington, D.C. What we're seeing in the organizing is it's a completely spontaneous grassroots, from the bottom up type um, operation. It makes me incredibly proud of the New Hampshire primary. And frankly, I think when the results are in, we will demonstrate why the New Hampshire primary is so important here, but also to our country. The idea that people can get together in living rooms, as Jamie said, a chance to see in town halls. I mean, in the middle of the blizzard, we had 120 people in Peterborough in their boots and their puffy coats. 125. 125 turning out because they cared about this message of saving democracy. And that's what's important, our voice 
in this process. So that's what I'm here for. That's what I think makes a difference. And I just, I've already voted because I'm not sure if, new, if the Congress is going to have a budget, so I'm not sure if I'm going to make it home on the 23rd. Um, and it was easy. It's, it, you go to the bottom of the ballot, you fill in the oval, you write in Joe Biden. It's very easy to spell. And I think people are going to feel really good about that vote. And they're going to send a message all across this country, um, we will not support an insurrectionist. Period. Ever. Period. And speaking with young voters, they've said they're not excited about voting for Joe Biden. What's your message to them? Oh, well, like, would Jamie take that? Because he's got such a good one. Well, if I could just quickly, yeah. um, I think New Hampshire sent oh, yeah. a very clear message this weekend. Half the delegates for the right in Joe Biden effort were young Democrats. There were young people who were excited to stand for the president, that are anxious to go to the convention, that really uh, displayed a great deal of effort and organization on their own behalf to get themselves elected. So here in New Hampshire, there's a great deal of youth enthusiasm for the president. And, but you, and I, I wanted to just add to that uh, about the young people, because I've spoken to a bunch of the young people in New Hampshire as well as in my native Maryland, and the young people are coming to the realization that this campaign is really about the future. And of course, this is Joe Biden's second and final term as president he will be entering. But it's the first election that a lot of these young people will be participating in, or maybe the second election. It's about the future. It's about the Democratic Party in the 21st century. It's about America in the 21st century. It's about what kind of world they're going to inhabit. And so. This cannot be the kind of election where people sit back on the sofa and then just watch the polls and uh, prognosticate about this candidate or that candidate. It's an election where people have to participate all over the country the way that the New Hampshire people do. Um, a, a question for all three of you. What number does the writing campaign of Joe Biden essentially need to hit on January 23rd to, sh or 23rd to show success? Is it 40%, 50%, 60%? What number? Show success to you guys. I think you'll be successful, and I think you'll win. I think a win is a win. I don't know that we can prognosticate today whether there's going to be another snowstorm or what's going to happen on that day, but a win is a win, and I think Joe Biden will get the majority of votes. And so is a win a win even if he wins, but it's still under 50 percent? Yes. There's 21 candidates, by the way, including Vermin Supreme. So. But also in the room this Saturday, mm -hmm. yes, there were young people, and yes, there was this delegation process. But mm -hmm. also in the room was whispers that the reality is Joe Biden's name is not on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And so when an average New Hampshire voter shows up to the polls on January 23rd, they're going to walk in and not see his name. So they're going to see us with signs and have conversations, grassroots conversations, friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm that are going to be standing at every single polling place across the state. They're already taking shifts. We were just at a meeting. I'll do the morning, you do the afternoon. And they're going to have a conversation that'll say, write in Joe Biden. It's not new. We've had writing candidates before. New Hampshire voters are very familiar with the process. But speaking of independents, mm -hmm. why should they go for Joe Biden over uh, Chris Christie, who has an anti-Trump message? I think they'll make that choice. I, I was talking to a couple uh, last night, and the husband is going to vote for Joe Biden, and the wife is going to vote for Nikki Haley. So uh, my message is that a vote for Donald Trump is an insurrectionist as a vote for um, the end of our democracy. And I think Liz Cheney really said it best the other day. She was very firm. She said, anyone who votes for Donald Trump that will be the last vote you ever cast. And that was chilling to me. But she is quite convinced that he will not give up power. Got time for one more. Okay, can I just add one thing on this one? Um, if you were trying to choose between Joe Biden and Chris Christie, and you were going to look at the question of political judgment, Joe Biden has never supported Donald Trump yes. for anything. Uh, Chris Christie was um, in the bag for Donald Trump for a real long time. So I'm glad that he's... As was Nikki Haley. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, that Chris Christie has gotten off the Donald Trump train, but we need somebody who's got much more centered political judgment than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, 
Um, how, can you talk a little bit more about how important it is to, you know, be here standing specifically behind the way that I'm signing should more big name Democrats who are not from New Hampshire come up here with one of the voices to support this effort? Well, for me, it's an honor to be here. I think, um, you know, as you were suggesting in your last question, it's obviously harder for a candidate to run as a write-in candidate than to have their name appear on the ballot. Um, and so I'm glad that the true blue Democrats of New Hampshire are going to get out and vote and bring their pens or whatever is the appropriate writing utensil for the election. Um, and I, I, I feel as strongly and passionately about this election and about the future as Joe Biden does, and I'm sure that the people of New Hampshire feel the exact same way. It's not just that he's got an extraordinary record to run on in terms of infrastructure and dramatically lowering uh, the cost of prescription drugs and standing up for women's right to choose and so on. It's also that he is standing up for the whole system of constitutional democracy that's under threat by Donald Trump, who wants to engage in these mass pardons. You know, and again, he is pardoned Paul Manafort, he's pardoned Michael Flynn, his disgraced national security advisor. He, did, he pardoned uh, Roger Stone, um, who is uh, you know, an infamous political criminal in the country. Uh, I mean, these people who are fundamentally opposed to um, liberal democracy in America. So everything is on the line here. You know, this is the fight of our lives, and we need all hands on deck. Again, it's not the kind of election where you can, you know, sit back and flip a coin or watch the polls. This is an election where we need everybody engaged and involved. And I should add, we've had a whole series of people join us on uh, Zooms, making contributions to us. So Cory Booker and um, Governor Pritzker and um, Governor Healy, was, Governor here Healy this was here this weekend. And even, I have to say, Liz Cheney choosing to come to New Hampshire, choosing to come to Dartmouth for that speech, I think um, people realize that the eyes of the nation will be on New Hampshire on January 23rd. And uh, so they're weighing in now and getting involved, and we're very excited about that. Representative, your, co your, your colleague, Dean Phillips, during the debate today, I just want to quote something he said going back to that letter that was sent from the DNC to the New Hampshire Democratic Party. He said, I think it's one of the most egregious affronts to democracy. Do you agree with that? Well, as I said, I'm not worried about it. It's the people of the state of New Hampshire that are standing up to take control of our democracy. This is what we do in town meeting. This is what we do when we run for the school board, when we run for the third largest English-speaking parliamentary body in the world here in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. And it's certainly what I did when I ran for Congress. So that's what's important. And we're going to send a very strong message. And trust me, this is the way to get the New Hampshire primary back. In 2028, I anticipate a lot of candidates coming to New Hampshire, and I'm really excited about it. Do you think the DNC made a mistake, though, by making South Carolina? I'm going to let them speak for themselves. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.